Hi, Wine Delusters, and in this episode, we're heading up to the King Valley in northeast Victoria. Welcome to the Wine Delust podcast. My name is Janine, and I run a wine events business in Canberra. But my real passion is travel, and my bucket list is to travel to every wine region in the world. In this series, I'll be exploring some regional Aussie wine destinations. I'll give you some tips whether you're planning a romantic getaway, a girls' weekend, or you're dragging the kids along. So pour yourself a glass, and let's get exploring. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. When I'm going around talking to winemakers, the connection that they have and the appreciation they have for the land is really obvious. And it always makes me think of our First Nations people and their real connection to the land. So I acknowledge and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. So today we're in the King Valley. This is a little part of Italy right here in Australia. It's not so much how it looks, The King Valley is in regional Victoria and it's full of big Australian eucalyptus and gum trees. It doesn't quite have the same architectural history, but it's the fabric of the people that live around here that brings out that Italian feeling. The main road through the region is called the Prosecco Road and you'll find such a massive array of Italian varietal wines along here. The road isn't too wide, but it winds through lush landscape with mountains on either side, which I later found out are escarpments that are also great for growing grapes, in addition to all the vineyards that you pass by. And there are cellar doors all the way along the road, from the south of Whitlands up to Millawa. So the modern history of how wine came to be around here is quite interesting. I knew of the Italian heritage of the region and assumed it arose from that. However, I met up with Fred Pizzini, who we'll hear from a bit later on, and I did a great tasting at the Brown Brothers Cellar Door. And with that tasting, I got a bit of a history lesson at the same time. So the first vintage of Brown Brothers was way back in 1889. Brown Brothers came to the region as farmers and were providing food to the people coming in for the gold rush. They were very instrumental in encouraging the Italian migrants that settled in the northeast Victoria after World War II to transition to planting grapes. My first guest is Fred Pizzini. His parents came out from Italy and he shares more about how the region was established. It was a glorious autumn day when we caught up And though it was midweek, the cellar door had guests enjoying the beautiful grounds outside. It's a beautiful big place with a gorgeous outdoor setting overlooking the vineyards. There's some massive barrels that you can check out. The cellar door has office space, event space and a private barrel room area. They also have accommodation nearby and run cooking classes. So it provides all types of experiences for whatever you're after in the area. Fred and I were having a great chat beforehand. So the start of this interview will be diving straight in. He's such a wealth of knowledge and it was such a pleasure meeting with him and I know you're going to enjoy our chat. Did you settle this up, Fred, or was it your father? My father, my father and mother, Robert and Rose, they settled here in the King Valley. So it's it's, it's an interesting question, that one, I don't know whether I'm first generation or second generation. Um, probably first generation in the wine industry, but second generation in the dynasty of the Pizzini family. Because it was tobacco farms around here, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was, all, it was all, well, that was the, that's what brought, you know, the Pizzini family into the King Valley was um, that there was land available and it was very suitable for growing of tobacco back in 1959, 1960, um, when the tobacco industry was um, booming and, 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 and was being very successful. So that's pretty much what brought them into the King Valley. And yeah, pretty much um, the family grew tobacco for quite a long time. I know when I left school, um, I finished my agricultural um, schooling. Um, I ended up in the tobacco industry, um, working in the family business for quite a long time. But it was it was a good industry to the family. But at the same time, back in the early seventies, it was just showing signs of decline. Mm-hmm. So um, the, the writing was on the wall for me. So back in the early seventies, with that happening. Myself and Katrina, my, my partner at the time, and still is, um, we're just looking for something to diversify. We wanted to live in the land because yeah. we just love living on the land. And so we, did, we, we, we were looking for diversification. And we, we, we ended up growing vegetables, zucchinis, you name it, you know what I mean, um, okra, sweet corn. The trouble is um, it was all too very close to the ground, so it was really physical and, and demanding. And we were too far away from our from our markets. The diversification out of tobacco into into wine was pretty easy. Oh, good, yep. 
Um, being Italian, there was always an acre of vines planted to make wine. So what were make... the first um, vines that were planted? Which, which wine? We planted Riesling, because Riesling was the variety of choice at that period yeah, of time. and cool climate. And cool guess. climate, that's, which suited the variety, which we um, supplied browns with oh, for yeah. a number of years in, in the early stages. Because they've got a big cellar door up the road, don't yeah, they? they? Yeah, yeah they have. they've got a beautiful operation. They're a tourist family. And we owe them a lot because, you know what I mean, they gave us that opportunity to diversify and to get into the industry back in 1978, yeah, oh, right. 80s. Yeah, so yeah. that was a really good stepping stone for us to get into the industry. Do you still make Riesling? Yes, we do. Oh, yeah. We do, yeah. I think that's going to be a stable variety for us. Given that um, out of our whole estate, I think pretty much Riesling is the only French variety we've got on the mm. vineyards. Yeah, because how many acres do you have here? About 300 yeah. of vines. And how many different varieties? You've got so many fantastic Italian varieties, that, so many that I hadn't ever tried other than your label, actually. So We're always looking for something new. It's a bit like the kitchen, it's only got salt and pepper. It can only make a certain style and a certain flavour of food. Um, so we, we've got a pantry of varieties. Yeah. And the bulk of them are from the northern Italian region, from out of Tuscany, Piemonte, Trentino at Adige, which is pretty much the, the village and the region that my family comes from. I suppose we've sort of chosen varieties that work, that work in the King Valley, that work in the upper reaches of the King Valley and the cooler, more um, stable weather conditions, I suppose, in the upper reaches of the King Valley. But you've been a little bit creative because I think some of the varieties are not found in very many other vineyards around, like... We got some interesting little varieties, and a good friend of mine, Mark Walpole, which was Brown Brothers' um, chief viticulturist, you know what I mean? Um, but he's just got a love for Italian varieties, or varieties in general, and we got on really, really well, which we have for the last 40 odd years. So we worked together quite closely with a lot of these sourcing of these varieties. And they're sourced from northern Italy? Some we found in Australia, they were in the, in the nurseries in the, in the Department of Agriculture which we used to be called in the old days, up in Mildura. So we found Nibbiolo up there, we found Sangiovese up there. All right. Other varieties were brought in through the proper quarantine um, it's system. Like hurdles and things, um, yeah. yeah. pretty <laughs> much, yeah, you know. From our, out of the Trentino to Adji region, from where I come from, we, the varieties we grow from there are pretty much on the Pinot Grigio. Um, is one, we've got another... Another little one called Teroldigo. That's the one that I had mm. recently. That was good. Yeah, it's, it's quite delicious. Um, that's a lovely red variety, mm. which makes an excellent wine at, at, at relatively low alcohol levels, pure dark in colour. Yeah. Quite fabulous. Uh, look, it's a flavour that it's a flavour you don't see in Shiraz or Cabernet or Merlot, um, and I think that's what makes it interesting. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed the one I had. Yeah, I suppose you know there's that one, and then there's another one called Verduzzo and Caniolo. They're sort of varieties that have been around for a long, long time. And we humans haven't taken the time to, to breed out some of the natural flavours that come from these varieties. Mm. And hence why I think they taste a little bit different. And they have a particular flavour, which we call marzipan, that sort of mm. little bit like a hazelnut, you yeah. know, that bittersweet I can see that, sort yeah. of flavour in the back of your palate, which has a, a lovely relationship with food. Yes, I agree. Those particular compounds. Yeah. Um, work work extremely well. And so, what's your favourite varietal? It depends what you're eating to <laughs> to what you when you choose, or do you have a go to? Oh, look, yeah, I, I, I think you know if you want to spoil yourself, and, and um, for me, um, I, I will be drinking Nebbiolo. Yeah. But me everyday sort of drink would be a combination of Barbera and uh, and the Nonna Gisella, which is a Sangiovese. Oh, great! Just a lovely, nice, bright cherry-like flavours. Um, mm. That's probably my go-to wine. And so what, what's the best seller? In table wines, is the Pinot Grigio, um, is, is our is our best and biggest seller, Australia wide. Yeah. Prosecco is definitely growing strongly, and in the red, our range of Sangioveses are our next biggest line of sellers. Yeah, and um, you guys have diversified. I first came to your cellar door. I think it was around two thousand and five, and it was the part that's still at the back there where the barrels were. <laughs> I think that was what I came into. When I drove in, I was like, that looks familiar from that time. But now you're a huge cellar yeah. door and you do cooking classes and you've got accommodation yeah, we've, on site. We've, ex we've expanded over the years. That's interesting. That 
little cellar door that you first visited was a tobacco curing barn. Oh, right. Okay. When we went out of the industry, Dad turned it into his little winemaking cellar where he made his wine and hung his salamis and stuff like that. From then we turned that into our cellar door, just did a little bit of work to it, turned it into our cellar door, and then we outgrew that Yeah. Um, in about five or six years, and um, we moved into our warehouse for four or five years, and, and when we did the redevelopment with the cooking school, a lovely kitchen for Katrina and to do what she does brilliantly, and the cellar door experiences and a bit of office space, that same building was turned into bathrooms. Yeah, all right. So it's, yes. it's, it's, it's lived an amazing um, life, that, <laughs> that building. <laughs> Talk about value for money. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's great that it's still there, though. You just give me another key It's still there. It's still very useful. <laughs> the externals look the, look the same as the day they were built in 1959-60. Yeah. Um, still functioning extremely well. The accommodation, is it, it's like a farmhouse or something that people can rent out, is that Yeah, right? they're, they're, they're pretty much, yeah, they're little bean bees. There's two of them. There's um, one right here on, on at, the, at the cellar door, which was a, a share farmer's cottage, which then was renovated, which oh, is quite, quite beautiful. And the other one's the old estate home. It's got about four or five rooms. It's quite a big house. Through the King Valley, this is called Prosecco Road, isn't it? Yeah. I remember when I was travelling through the wine regions of, of the Veneto region, be about 30 years ago, and I come across this, they call it, in Italian, they call it La Strada della Marone, which is the road of the Amarone, oh. which Amarone is, comes from the Veneto region. And it was just captured the imagination. It was just brilliant. You know, the wineries are quite close there. So, you you know, groups would walk, like, like a Dolce Vita weekend mm. type thing, and you'd walk from one winery to another where they'd show you... You'd only see Amarone, they wouldn't show you any other wine. Oh, right. And they had a, a, a you know a little snack to go with it. Oh, cool. And it'd be like a musical chair, and you went up to about ten different little wineries, which I thought was awesome. Yeah. So I think the concept comes from a little bit of that, you know what I mean, the Prosecco Road. So there's, I think there's about six or seven wineries that are actually part of the Prosecco Road, which they do different experiences... For the person that you know that wants to um, sign up into it or look yeah. in, yeah. Well, I think um, yeah. I mean, prosecco is very popular it's pretty, in Australia. Isn't it's it, seriously so. popular. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. The King Valley, you know, really, really leading the charge with Pinot Grigio and Sangiovese and prosecco. Mm. Pretty well, awesome. The little Italy. You know, for, forty <laughs> years ago, you go when you when I made my first barrel of Sangiovese. You, you know, it was really. Uh, I'm not going to share this. I'm going to drink it myself. But we did share it, and lo and behold, it's just taken off oh. taken a while yeah, a yeah. whole generation um but but uh, just a great story it is it is mm. congratulations it's great thank you. yeah thank, thank you, you. Mm. thank you very much for your time in addition to the winemakers that have been here for a long time my next guest alistair from konpiru maru and his winemaking partner sam cook are young winemakers who, while they don't have a cellar door, source much of their fruit from the King Valley to make their wines. Their wine bottles have the most fabulous artwork and very fun descriptions. They've also branched out to making gin and you can also buy pre-mixed cocktails. I had a great time meeting Al and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this chat. All right, Alistair, thank you so much for joining me. Now, firstly, how did the name of the winery come about? This is a, d- a disappointing part of our history. <laughs> is that I always say that you need, uh, well, I think it's common held knowledge, like a story has to be interesting or funny or sad. And um, this is like none of those. It's just, uh, so Sam is the other half of Compira Maru. And we're both fans of Ninja Warrior, the Japanese game show. And we love Makoto Nagano, who was like the big star back then. And he was this like ultra shredded sort of 45 year old athlete. He did all his training on his fishing boat, and uh, it was called the Kimpira Maru. So we named after that, but then subsequently we discovered there's there's a connection with uh, Kerry Packer <laughs> as well. I know it's really random, and it, it's actually really strange because Bruce Chalmers, who of the Chalmers family yeah. that that brought in a lot of the Italian varieties that King Valley's famous for, and he rang me out of the blue and he asked, "Oh, where did Kimpira Maru came from?" And I said, "Oh, well, blah blah blah," and uh, he goes, "Oh, well." I used to run the biggest shipping company in Papua New Guinea. I had a ship called the Compira Maru. And then I said, well, Bruce, I just learnt last week that in the rise and rise of Kerry Packer, 
apparently he rented the computer in my room to go and report on, on a war in um, Timor. He goes, yeah, I would have rented in that boat. It was like this wild, wild connection. Maru, uh, every ship in the Japanese fleet is something Maru. Oh, right. And so it's just computer, like, boat. And uh, there's, like, heaps of computer Maru. It just happens that one's owned by a ninja warrior and the other one was... Do you have a lot of by. Japanese people interested in your wines, do you think? We yeah. sell a little bit over in Japan. By all reports, Masa, who's our distributor over there, lovely guy, he says it doesn't hurt that we're <laughs> good computer Maru. And we used to get, actually, on an Instagram profile, we used to get a fair few messages in Japanese about fish. Because he was a mackerel, <laughs> mackerel fisherman. We don't, I don't know why, but we don't get it so much anymore. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great story. That's ridiculous, mate. That's... So how did that... you get into wine then? Yeah, so I'd always been into wine. And I come from a plant science background. Right. I was finishing my PhD and I was going over time. And this lovely lady, Helen Waite, started in the lab I was in. And she was, as it so happened, the first head of department for this new wine degree. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so she offered me the job teaching insects. So when my scholarship ran out, I started teaching casually at NMIT. So and this then, is about looking after the grapes, the insects side of things? Yeah, so yeah, it was like insect identification. It was more about ecology, so how to like fit into the whole cycle. I got into that, and, and the guy who was working in the diploma was just excellent. I was just speaking to him today. Mark Matthews is out in Gippsland, makes incredible Pinot and Chardonnay. And uh, he was sort of my winemaking mentor. Yeah, that's how I got into it. Yeah, I went to the Brown Brothers cellar door um, the other day. Actually. In Millowa? Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, so I, um, it gave me a new appreciation for Brown Brothers. Cause well, they're sort of like the big little label, as yeah. I like to see them. Yeah. And the Brown Brothers, I actually took a field trip up there a couple of years ago, and it was really interesting. We just sort of followed the story of Brown Brothers and their influence mm-hmm. over the valley and instrumental in that conversion, deciding which varieties. And then there was a little backlash against Brown Brothers, and that started a whole sort of different movement. You can't talk about the King Valley and most of the Alpine Valley without talking about Brown Brothers and I really admire personally mm-hmm. uh, I know you didn't ask but yeah, no, here no, I go yeah. I, I really admire Brown Brothers because <clears throat> certainly when I was growing up they were like a go to wine for everybody's parents I think and they're just good value super say, tasty wines reliable yeah that's so right. reliable mm. and I personally or our company and our peers are seeing a movement slowly back to that again we were bemoaning the fact that you couldn't buy a good value, cool, like not cool, but interesting wine on a Wednesday night without yeah. spending 35 bucks. And so our aim was to make those wines, and it still is. But That's a good aim. as a matter yeah. of fact, Brown Bellas were doing it the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I guess so, the word interesting, because um, you've got some really interesting blends in that, and you've done a lot of pet gnats and things. There's really an, an unrestrained element to wine making in Australia at the moment and there's not a lot of rules that need to be followed uh, anymore and so when it comes to blends it's just what tastes good and obviously a lot of old world GIs have strictures of rules that are in place whereas in Australia we we only have conventions we don't have rules apart from some additives into the wines but in terms of blends you can do whatever you like and do multi-regional blends all good we did a blend this year, which is, I suppose, a good example, which was a Shiraz from the Alpine Valley from a vineyard in Port Punka that was set up to service browns. One in Myrie, which is in the King Valley, an offshoot of the King Valley. Dolcetto from Edi in the King Valley. Gewurz from Whitlands up at our vineyard. And then Sangiovese from Grampians. Wow. And those five just came together to make a really nice, chilled, soft red. Yeah. Because once you start, you can't stop because varieties like can counterpoint each other so nicely that when you put them together, they just... So what's one of your favourite blends? But the favourite actually is one we just started doing last year. It's in a blue bottle. It's called Panopticon and it's a Riesling Pinot Gris Gewurz field blend. And it's from a really interesting, like talking in the King Valley, a really interesting geological feature of the King Valley are these two ridges. So there was a volcano in this town of Tolmy, which is about 20k north of Mansfield, and it erupted, and these two lava flows oh. flowed basically north, and they're now called what we call the rivers in the sky. They're these two tongues that lead to the King Valley, and one of them has Whitlands proper, and then one of them has this semi-forgotten part of Whitlands on what's on Mount Bellevue and the ridge that leads up to Mount Bellevue, which was part of this these lava flows. And so these grapes come from this second forgotten ridge which is about 600 and something meters above sea level 
Oh, it's cold. It's beautiful. It's around the 60 degree views of the countryside. It's absolutely magnificent. Yeah. You go up there on this little goat track. And the wine's just like super zesty, flavoursome from the grey. And we're doing these blue bottles. And it was awesome. And so we're doing it again this year. That's my favourite one. So you make all the wine in, your, in Melbourne? You bring the grapes down? Oh, uh, we do a bit of both. Yep. Yeah, we, sort of this is like our finishing area. Most of the fermentation happens in the King Valley. And you also can't take any grapes out of the King Valley because of the phylloxera zone. Whereas here yes. we're, we're in an exclusion zone. We do at least partial ferment, and then it either comes down here to finish ferment or it just stays up there. All the wines from our vineyard are all wild fermented out in the vineyard. Yeah. So we actually set up fermenters outside next to the vines. Cool. Um, and so they spend their entire life until bottling within five metres of the vines. It's very easy to say wild ferment is a wank, but I've done enough projects with students looking at ferments in the, in the vineyard compared to ones in the winery to see that you actually do get a really interesting diverse population of yeast and last question you have such great artwork on your labels yeah that. <laughs> thank you is that you've just got a, an artist that does that for you or is it by different people or because they all look yeah. kind of um not similar but look like they're by the same person. yeah well right. bredo i'll be happy to say that because bredo's a graphic designer and like a absolute legend yeah. he sort of set the scene for the sort of whimsical labels and he was always big on making sure that we were sort of consistent in our approach and then he's got busier and busier with his life and so he only does occasional labels now and so a mate of ours um Huey Brooks guy from Melbourne has been doing a few and he's, he's amazing and he's also got a similar aesthetic to it. and then also recently we've been getting a couple from a lady called Pauline from Berlin oh wow and she approached us on Instagram and said, like, you know, like your aesthetic or whatever. And That's cool. Yeah, we're like, oh, well, we needed a gin label and Bretto was busy. So a couple of years ago, we distilled some wine up in <clears> Queensland <throat> and made a gin called Barry after Sam's dad. She did that label and she's done a couple more as well. And they're absolutely fantastic. Yeah, tell so us about your gin in that. Sam knows some distillers. And so they distilled it with Sam up on the Sunshine Coast during COVID. And then he sent samples of the raw spirit to myself and his cousin in Tassie, who was a distiller as well, and everyone nominated some botanicals to go into oh, the gin mix. And we wanted to make a sipping gin that you just have with ice rather than having to mix it. Mm. I'm claiming it. I said we should call it the Barry because Barry cooks Sam's dad, who's even grumpier than Sam, but he's been our, our cellar hand in Queensland forever oh, and he works himself to the bone. He's a legend. And I said the year was a shocker, so it was a Barry Crocker. But then out of it, we made this delicious gin and Barry Cook's a legend. So I was like, legendary bit. Shocker. <laughs> it's the Barry. So you're going to keep the, the gin going as well as the wines? Yeah we'll, do, yeah, we'll do a gin every other year, I think. Is there anything else you'd like to share or is there anything else you wanted to talk about with them? The King Valley has been, we've been up there now for seven years. It's just been so good. Mm. I've never been anywhere. This, this is not a lie. This is not just empty platitudes. You know, people are just genuinely nice. Like, they're not pulling it on. They're just genuinely nice. So for us, we just love making wine in the King Valley. And it's been awesome that mates of ours who have wine labels are slowly moving more operations to the King Valley as well. Because you you work with genuine people. Um, They work really hard to be as sustainable as possible. It's just an awesome part of the world. It is. It's beautiful. And it's not, like, what, three hours up the road? It's just the right distance because... you're not going to do a day trip. It's forced you to no, stay up there, I yeah. reckon. You yeah. stay in like Moy- Moyu Pub, stay in Whitfield, or you can stay in Wang, and then just have just a great, day, great yeah. time. That, that was my closing remarks. Awesome. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. That's really great. Pleasure. Yeah. So some of my favourite cellar door suggestions are, you definitely have to visit Pizzini. Nearby is Del Zotto, and they're open for lunch daily. Up the road is the King Valley Brewing if you fancy a refreshing ale. As you head north to Millowa, Sam Miranda's on the outskirts and it has a beautiful cellar door there too. And as noted before, I had a great tasting at the Brown Brothers Cellar Door that's located in Millowa. They've got a lot of wines available there at the cellar door that you don't see in the big bottle shop chains. If you heard my interview with Kate Schilling in the festive season, she talked about the great wine experiences that you can do there that you can order through the Ultimate Winery Experiences Australia website. So what wines to try? 
Well, if you're in the King Valley, you have to try the Italian varieties here. Prosecco is a big one. Also Sangiovese, Montepulciano. There are so many interesting varieties that you'll come across. All the wines that I've tried are very approachable. The red tenons are in general not too overpowering, so even a young red is very drinkable right away. So the other things to do and see. All around northeast Victoria is a beautiful Victorian high country. It's great for hiking, you can hire bikes around the region, and I understand there's some good fishing too. Milawa is a great little town and has a fantastic cheese factory, which is worth checking out. In Whitfield, which is a little town in the middle of the King Valley, there's a fine food shop with local produce. The King Valley isn't too far away from the town of Glen Rowan. It's quite a small town, but you will see lots and lots of Ned Kelly statues here. And the beautiful town of Beechworth is also about half an hour away, and that has a rich bushranger history and a gold rush history also. If you've got kids, they will love the bushranger history in the region. Personally, just checking out the cellar doors and having a long lunch is the perfect way to spend a weekend. So quick stats. The King Valley is about three hours northeast of Melbourne. Don't be like me and listen to Google Maps and turn off at Benalla because some of that road is unpaved and the mobile reception is a little bit dodgy and it feels like you're in the middle of nowhere. Instead, continue 30 minutes up the Hume Highway to Wangaratta and it's much easier to drive into the King Valley from there. It's about a five hour drive from Canberra and seven hours from Sydney. The closest airport is Albury, but that's a good 90 minutes away. So you do need a car in this area. If you're coming from Melbourne, you would be able to get a train up to Wangaratta and do a wine tour from there. Accommodation. This is a quite a small area for accommodation. Pizzini has a four-bedroom cottage available directly opposite their cellar door, and Mount Bellevue Winery has a beautiful three-bedroom cottage also. The tiny town of Whitfield has a few options. Staying in Whitfield is handy because there's a pub there, and it's one of the few places that you can get dinner at. The town of Millor at the north end also has a pub and a motel, which is fairly basic, but it's quite convenient. If you like the idea of glamping, you can check out the Yurt Alpine Retreat with its traditional Mongolian yurts. Wangaratta does have some more accommodation options with reliable brands of Quality Hotel and Quest and it's about a 20 minute drive away. And of course you have to try the Italian varieties when you go to the King Valley. Thank you so much for listening. There's a back catalogue of about a dozen other wine regions to listen to. Till next time, cheers and happy wine travelling. For everything discussed today, check out the Wine Delust website And if you're interested in trying some of the wines, we have some events coming up too. And subscribe to my newsletter.